Welcome to Careers in Discovery, your window into the world of leaders in pharma and biotech. Brought to you by Singular Talent, making hiring better for organizations involved in drug discovery and R&D. Victoria Marsh Durban is the CEO of Celeste, a Cardiff-based biotech championing the industrialization of organoids. Vicky talked to us about her journey from academic researcher to CEO, learning to run a business without any formal training, and how going on maternity leave propelled her into a career in industry. I'm delighted this week to be joined by Victoria Marsh Durban, CEO of Celeste. Vicky, welcome to Careers in Discovery. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Um, I'd love to start by talking a bit more about Celeste and the work that you're doing there. So tell us a bit about the company. Tell us a bit about patient-derived organoids. Absolutely. So um, Celeste is a relatively small company. We're a spin out from the universities of Bath and Cardiff. So we're mm-hmm. still based, based in Cardiff at the Medicenter, which is on, on the main uh, hospital campus. Um, so we really specialise in organoid manufacturing. Um, so uh, we've developed a novel and patented bioprocess. As far as we're aware, it's the only bioprocess in the whole world that's that's focused on manufacturing organoids. OK. Um, and so that's that's really our specialism. So, you know, we're very much a hybrid biology and bioengineering company. Um, we, as I say, we're really focused specifically on just the, the manufacturing of organoids. So very much going from an established organoid line, scaling mm. that up, making, making lots of organoids. Um, so you're probably asking yourself, what on earth are organoids? If you're not <laughs> familiar with them, I'll define for you what, what organoids are. And, uh, you know, being a fairly new technology, people do mean different things when they're talking about mm. organoids. So um, for, for us at Celeste, um, organoids are, are three-dimensional cell cultures. Um, so they're derived direct from patient biopsies. They're never cultured in 2D. They're always cultured in 3D, uh, typically cultured within a hydrogel matrix, which is often matrigel. Um, yes. So they're an animal-derived or a, a naturally-derived um, synthetic um, non-synthetic hydrogel. Um, and effectively, they, they grow in three dimensions. Um, they grow um, establishing from the stem cells that are present within the original tissue biopsy. Mm-hmm. And they sort of spontaneously arrange themselves to recapitulate the architecture of what was in the original patient biopsy. So you can almost think of it as taking, you know, a patient biopsy, simplifying it a little bit, establishing it in culture and maintaining it in that three dimensional state long term. So effectively, you're making sort of lots and lots of patient biopsies that you can then go on to use as a tool right. for, for testing drugs upon. Yes, I see. And this should bring you hopefully a bit closer to live situations, right? A bit, a bit closer to the live environment that you would use those therapies in. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's that's really the sort of thesis that we stand behind is that mm. you know, organoids represent a much, much better, more representative in vitro model. So they've got all the benefits of still being an in vitro and a cell culture model that you can use to test drug compounds easily and quickly, um, but give you much more relevant data. And, and actually, organoids have been shown already in the academic literature to be formally predictive of the patient response mm-hmm. so more predictive than your standard two dimensional cell lines, which tend to be the workhorse at the moment of, of drug discovery and drug development studies. Yes, yes, I see. And, and you mentioned as well that your your approach to developing organoids is unique, um, without giving the game away, of course. Can you tell us a bit about that? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, so what's really unique to Celeste is it's our bioreactor technology and our mm-hmm. bioprocess technology. Um, so it's, it's more than just the bioreactor, it's actually the whole end-to-end process of how, how we scale organoids. Um, so typically at the moment, when people grow organoids, they do it in the lab. It's a very manual sort of laborious uh, culture process. And what we do is um, uh, we like to say we, we take the boring out of growing organoids. So, so we've got an established process that, you know, is fully quality controlled and quality assured, mm-hmm. um, which basically just allows us to produce a large batch of organoids as a single batch. So um, whereas someone in a lab might be able to grow, you know, a few thousand or a few hundred thousand organoids in one go, we can grow sort of. Uh, at the moment, we can grow up to 5 million organoids in one go, okay. and we'll be um, expanding that up to sort of 20 to 25 million organoids as a single batch once we've got our new process online. I see. Okay, so you can then use those to to get some real data uh, for your research. And, yeah, and absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so it, it really unlocks, you know, all of those applications that need either a high number of organoids or very high quality organoids or batches that you can go back to again and again to conduct the same study over and over again to get the same results. Yes, I see. Um, and we're here, you're, you're, you've just taken over at the beginning of the year as CEO, Vicky, and 
the focus for today is really about your career as a whole. So we'll talk a bit about the, the earlier part of it as well. Um, one of the things I was interested to talk to you about is that um, we don't see as commonly people joining a company in a scientific research role and progressing into a CEO role. And that's what you've done during your, your time with um, Celeste. So tell us a bit about what you're doing today. Tell us a bit about your journey with the company and, and that transition that you've made. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I joined Celeste about three years ago. I joined originally as lead scientist, so heading mm -hmm. up the R and D department. Um, at, you know, at that at that point, we were slightly smaller than we are now. We've grown a little bit in the time that I've been with Celeste, albeit not a huge amount. Um, so, I was really heading up sort of the operational side of things, all of the scientific R and D we were doing, managing research collaborations. You know, very much embedded in in the scientific side of things. Mm -hmm. um, I think about six months after I joined the pandemic hit. So then obviously every, everyone <laughs> kind of went home and 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 started doing more desk-based work. Yes. Um, and so at that point, I very much got much more involved in what we were doing on kind of the BD side of things and much more on the kind of strategy side of things. Obviously at that point, you know, we didn't have any staff in the lab. We had most of our lab staff on furlough at that point. Mm. There wasn't really a huge amount to do on, on the R&D side of things. Um, so that kind of really made me focus much more on, you know, more the strategy side of things um, and really what was kind of going on on a company level in terms of, you know, man managing our operations. And then obviously, you know, I, I ended up leading, getting the company back to work after lockdown and after all the furlough had, had yes. finished. And so that became a much more operational role. So that kind of led me really naturally into progressing into the chief operating officer role, which mm -hmm. I did um, at the start of, of 2021. Um, so spent a year in that role and again sort of that gave me a lot more experience to you know being involved at board level getting involved with with those sort of board conversations that and really you know having a chance to start setting the strategy rather than just executing the strategy yes. so that gave me you know some really good experience there and then yeah as, as as things turned out at the end of end of last year I was asked to step into the CEO role um which which I did at the start of this year um, and yeah, I'm still kind of, I think, learning by doing, as, as, as I would like to say, um, you know, obviously, I, I don't have any formal business training, I have exclusively scientific mm. training. So um, I've definitely got a lot to learn, but obviously, with the, with the right support around and, and sort of helping me to transition into that role within the company has, has been great. And, and that's, you know, really, really what I'm getting, getting stuck into now and getting my teeth into. And as I say, uh, learning a lot as I'm going along, you know, the learning <laughs> has been exceptional. Um, but it's been great. It's been a really interesting ride. Yeah. So you, you've been, I suppose, your role has evolved through a period of, of really significant change for the company, hasn't it? And I guess yeah. that's exposed you to things that, um, well, none of us have been through before. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Has it been what you expected stepping into this this position? Um, I'd say it has and it hasn't. I think Celeste is at, um, you know, it's an, an unusual point in its um, in its history at the moment. We're just embarking on a, on the largest fundraise we've ever conducted as a company. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we, we are a business that's, that's in need of fundraising. So there's been an awful lot of learning in terms of interacting with investors and pitching to investors. And so, you know, really much more on that side of things than I've ever done before. Um, albeit I'd, I'd done a little bit of it sort of over the last couple of years. Yes. Um, but as I say, really sort of taking the lead on that and engaging with investors and, you know, really convincing them of, of the business plan of Celeste and that I can deliver on that over the next few years. So it's it's been really interesting and um, certainly a lot more um, focused on relationship building and on people than than I've probably done done in the past. But actually, I really enjoy that. So that's that's been a great opportunity. Yes, no, it makes sense. And, and you mentioned that it's very much learning by doing at the moment, which I think is true for, for a lot of uh, CEOs, uh, and that you have you don't have any formal business training. Again, I think that's um, something that a lot of people who've come through the scientific or the, the R&D route probably are in a similar boat. Some some might, but a lot don't. Um, is, uh, is there anything particularly you think you've done to, to expand your business knowledge or anything that's been particularly useful for you so far? Um, I mean, I think really, I just say getting stuck in in right. all aspects of, of the business. Um, I think, you know, a, a lot of time people who are on the more technical side of the business kind of probably think, you know, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm on the technical side of the business. I'm a scientist. I have to stay in the lab or I have to stay focused on the scientific side of things. And mm. there's very much this sort of feeling that you kind of need to stick stick to your knitting and you know the other things that go on in the company are either not of concern to you or you've got nothing to offer to those departments but right. actually, I think that's completely not true it's especially in a small company um and in a small company that is very tech focused I think the more technical mm. or even on the business side of the the 
the company the better um so you know I, I think just not being afraid to get to get stuck into things like BD and things like talking to customers and you know at the end of the day it's really just you know talking to people understanding what they need how you can help them offering your view your expertise and and you know I'd say, I'd say that's really you know something that I've I've really enjoyed is just getting stuck into all different aspects and then even you know you end up getting involved in things like finance discussions then right yeah again you know some people would say that the finance side of things is you know perhaps not as interesting as the scientific side of things or you know it's that it's very much the nuts and bolts in the day-to-day but actually having an understanding and appreciation of how the business actually runs even on mm-hmm. a financial level is is really interesting to me and and very important obviously because it allows you to I always feel like the more knowledge you've got and the more information the better you can build that picture of what the company's doing the better you can perform in your role because you have much more strategic yes. over overview of what's going on in other departments and what they're trying to achieve and how how the bigger picture is formed so I think that's always been really important to me yeah no that makes sense and I think it's, it's interesting isn't it because um whatever if, if you had done an MBA you had taken courses or what have you it still remains the case that every company is different and even within the same company, everybody approaches that role slightly differently. And there's so many things that you're involved in. The, the job itself is so varied, um, not just from person to person or company to company, but from month to month and certainly quarter to quarter and year to year. Um, that there's not really a, I don't know that there's really a, a sort of course you can go on that will go, okay, this is how you do it. So yeah. I suppose putting yourself in situations where you're exposed to things and, and um, I guess pushing yourself to do things that maybe you don't know that much about, but uh, you know you have that understanding of the company as a as a sort of thread to fall back on. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And in terms of training, you know, this is something that I always talk to, you know, the, the rest of the Celeste team about. You know, there's, mm-hmm. there's no point in just doing a training course just for the sake of doing a training course, right? You need a way to actually then be able to apply what you learn. Mm apply it in a meaningful way to what you're doing so you know it's all very well you know collecting certificates and and other other elements of training but you know it, it, at the end of the day it comes down to application and how you use that knowledge and how you apply it to what you're doing yes yeah absolutely we may well come back to this as we as we talk through your your career to date so i, I always like to take it back to the beginning though um so originally you went and became a biologist and and did your phd in mammalian genetics Yep. We'll take it back a little bit further than that. Why science for you, Vicky, first of all? And, and at what point did it become drug R&D and, and this career for you? Yeah, so I think the science, I mean, sciences in school always really appealed to me because I really, I enjoyed the intellectual side, but actually I also enjoyed really doing things that were very hands-on. I was okay. always yeah. very much into, you know, I've always enjoyed making things with my hands mm-hmm. and building things like I love DT in school I love doing woodwork I did that out of school as well with my dad a little bit you know right. and, um I was always into even like you know like crafty type things so like sewing or you know making things you know just building things with my hands and having mm-hmm. something tangible and having that practical element I really enjoyed and so for me like science really fitted with that because I enjoyed both the intellectual side of things and like understanding what was going on plus being able to do the practical execution as well so it right. not just being theory but actually doing as well and I found that that really just gelled for me and, and really appealed to me and you know I'd even say now that I'm you know I'm very much a, a visual learner if I can see something and I can see how it works I'll learn it much better than just learning something off a page so it was very yeah. much the practical element that really drew me to science in the first place um again I think specifically into biology then I think you know again that that was just really pure interest you know like being able to sit there and think oh you know this is something that's actually going on inside me right now or mm-hmm. is going on inside everyone right now and you know having that immediate like relatable um you know scenario that you can think of 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 what's going on it's like all right you know this this is actually happening you know it's not like it's so abstract and so theoretical that you can't you know relate it to to real life and and to what's going on right Mm. now and so that that's kind of really what drew me into into biology um and actually yeah so much so my first degree was in biochemistry again mainly because I couldn't think I couldn't decide between doing biology and doing chemistry so I thought (laughs) well you know just put the two together and you get biochemistry so you know when I was 18 that seemed sensible you know putting yeah yeah things together um, so my my BSc was actually in in biochemistry original which I originally which I did in Cardiff. Um, again, really really enjoyed that, and I found that the parts that I enjoyed the most was sort of understanding disease biology and understanding mm-hmm. the pathology of disease, and particularly the kind of genetic basis of disease and how 
you know, very tiny genetic changes can lead to these massive sort of life changing diseases of, of all different kinds. And yes. particularly cancer was really interesting to me in terms of obviously, um, you know, how, how cancer evolves and how cancer originates and, and along those lines. So that's kind of really what led me then into doing my PhD. Um, and as you say, my PhD was in mammalian genetics, actually primarily focused on developing animal models to use for, for um, basic research and for drug testing. So I mm -hmm. think in terms of how I've got into drug discovery in particular, I'd say I've always really actually focused not directly on drug discovery, but more indirectly in terms of looking at developing models that can be used for drug sure, discovery, yeah, and developing yeah. really appropriate models that can be used for the most effective and the most efficient drug discovery possible. Mm. Um, so actually, so then, so as I say, in my PhD, I was really focused on developing, um, you know, more more animal models for disease, um, and obviously, you know, that has a number of uh, implications, you know, particularly on the ethical side of things. Mm -hmm. And um, at the time, the models that I was developing were all models of, of intestinal cancers, um, and the reason that we were developing mouse models for those was that at the time, actually, there were no cell culture models available for those diseases. Okay. They were not good models and they didn't exist. Yeah. And actually, this is one of the key things that organoid technology really changed, is that it really revolutionised the work that was done in my PhD lab pretty much overnight. I see. Um, okay. So once organoid models came out and people learned how to do organoid culture and learned how that worked, you know, all of a sudden there was this massive shift away from being only able to use animals for experimentation to all of a sudden having a system that was actually really relevant and useful for the yes. type of biology and disease that we were studying in the lab. So that made a massive difference. And actually, you know, I think that always stayed with me in terms of really seeing firsthand the power of organoid technology mm -hmm. and how that can really transform, you know, what you're doing just by having a, a much more effective and a much more representative model that you can actually use. So, so that definitely stayed with me. Yes. Um, so after, after I did my PhD, I, I post doc for a while. So I spent in total 10 years in academia. Um, I post doc in the States at UCSF in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So that was a really great experience. Um, and I think in terms of like, if you were thinking of kind of some of the, the formative moments in my career, I think working in the States was definitely one of them. Okay. Um, I, I, a, I really enjoyed it. It was a great experience. It was a lot of fun. Um, but also it really gave me some exposure to a lot of different cultures and a lot of different approaches to working and different mindsets to work and I think mm. one thing that really surprised me again you know I, I moved out to the states thinking oh you know I've watched a lot of American TV shows and you know <laughs> I know quite a lot about like American culture and how it works and you know they speak English so how different can it really be but yeah. actually the thing that was a real surprise to me was just this completely different mindset and attitude towards pretty much everything okay um, yeah so there was a real like, you know, um, it's this this attitude to, you know, towards wanting to show off what you're doing and to really sell what you're doing and to have this real like enthusiasm about what you're doing and to mm. really, um, really, as I say, really sell it and, see, you know, talk about how amazing it is. And like, oh, you know, look at this research I'm doing. It's so amazing. It's so impactful. And, you know, it's like a real different mental attitude to what I see as more the British attitude, which yes. is more like you know oh you know I did this it, it was okay you know it's very much <laughs> sort of like hiding your light under a bushel kind of kind of yeah accident. and so I think that actually was really really um it had a really big impact on me in terms of how I then saw like what what I was doing and how to sell it and you know just realizing that you know there, there's no shame in selling what you're doing like if mm. you think what you're doing and you think it's great then why not go out and say that you know why why play it down you know why why make it um seem less than it is if you you know if you really believe that what you've got is great and you think it's really impactful then just go out and say it you know it's there's as I say there's there's no shame in that no and it, it's a subtle difference isn't it but I remember noticing the same thing when I was out in the U.S. was that at first you kind of almost not turn your nose up at it it's too strong a word but like you say you know we, we're sort of taught to to not be boastful or, or to to not blow our own trumpets that kind of thing and so you sort of resist it a little bit at first and think oh this is a bit strange but then actually that enthusiasm is pretty infectious right and, okay. and the fact that people are passionate and excited about what they're doing is really nice <laughs> it's... precisely yeah 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 so, so that was as I say that's definitely something that I've I've taken with me and I try and keep or albeit, albeit you know I think the, the effect does wear off after a while so <laughs> I have to remind myself of that but um yeah I think that that as I say that level of enthusiasm and positivity about what you're doing and just the general like real can-do attitude I think I'd definitely try and try and keep that as I've, as I've moved forward yeah 
you know, I, I had a friend who lived in San Francisco for some time. He was a British guy and he moved back and moved to London. Um, and he grew up in London and, and uh, was very familiar with it, but he'd been out there for a long time, I think about eight or nine years. Um, and he said to me once, I, I forgot that people don't smile here. And he was, he was comparing his experience in San Francisco with his, his experience on the central line in the morning, but. Yeah, in <laughs> comparison ever. Yeah. Um, so San Francisco, so there was a formative experience for you. Um, you did some exciting work out there. Um, I guess built on the enthusiasm that you had for, for the models and, and enabling research and, and developing new ways to do research. And then came back to Cardiff and got involved in an interesting project there. Yep, so, so came back to Cardiff and ended up um, with um, an independent fellowship at the European Cancer Stem Cell Research Institute, mm -hmm. part of Cardiff University. Um, so again, I had a very small group, I think for most of the time it was myself and a summer student, again, applying for grants, trying to trying to juggle that, applying for grants and doing research myself in the lab at the same time, both of which are kind of full-time jobs. So that was that was quite tough to try and juggle that. Yes. Um, and then actually went on maternity leave. Um, so I did the fellowship for about a year before going on mat leave. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously took a full year out to, to have my son um, and, and, and came back after that effectively and kind of came back initially part time. And I think um, in terms of other formative moments in, in my career, I think actually, funnily enough, maternity leave was a really big okay. um, mindset changer for me. I think mm -hmm. it kind of, you know, it made me realize a couple of things. I think firstly, although I absolutely love being at home with my son for a year and I wouldn't change that for the world, it actually made me realize that my career actually is quite important to me. And I right. yeah. said a really important part of who I am and, and what I do and that I that was something that I didn't want to lose. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of made me realize that that was, was something that I definitely wanted to do. Um, and the other thing that happened while I was on maternity leave is actually my... Um, the head of the European Cat Stem Cell Research Institute, who was also my former PhD mentor, actually sadly passed away while I was on maternity leave. Okay. When I came back, I felt like the environment that I came back to had really changed and felt mm. really different. And I felt like um, I felt like I'd lost an advocate within the organisation. And I think that also made me realise that actually one thing that had been really important to me is not the work necessarily that I was doing, but also who I was working for. And it really yeah. made me realise the impact of um of you know who you work for and who is you know your mentor your supervisor your boss you know your senior and and how much influence actually they have on what you're doing and how mm -hmm. much motivation that can give you in your day-to-day -day work if if you've got someone that you you know you really expect um, respect and look up to um and so those those kind of things together I think when I was on maternity leave just as I say, coming back into the academic environment, I mean, the academic environment, I think, is pretty tough anyway, and trying to juggle that yeah. with being a young, you know, having a young child as well, and trying to juggle, you know, all of the, you know, having having a kid in nursery, having, you know, like, constant illness, basically, so constantly having to take time off and go mm -hmm. in and out, and also having a, you know, a, a still a very small research group that clearly had just been put on pause while I was on maternity leave because nothing had happened. Right, okay. So it was still really only, you know, me, you know, working in the lab, trying to get grant funding, if that wasn't happening because I needed to be out looking after my son or, you know, something along those lines, then really nothing was happening and everything was grinding to halt. So I was just like, you know what, this is, this is not working for me right now. So yes. it made me kind of think like I need to, I need to look at doing something different. And, mm -hmm. um, and for a long time, I actually wasn't totally sure what that was. I was like, you know, do I, do I just quit bench research and do something more desk based and like look at using my scientific knowledge somewhere else? Like, do mm. I want to get into medical writing or, you know, something that's more, you know, less, less needing to have time in the, in the lab and, and, you know, it's a little bit more nine to five kind of thing. Yes. Um, but then actually I sort of thought, you know, I, I don't really want to leave the bench yet. You know, as I say, I was, I've always been really motivated by doing practical work and I kind of wanted to keep that going. So, so I thought actually, you know, why don't, why don't I take a look around and see what's out there and look mm. at other roles and, you know, um, something that's a bit less precious. So initially I was sort of looking for maybe, you know, other postdoc roles, which maybe weren't independent. I mean, it would have been a bit of a step back, but, you know, just something where I could do, do a role within a lab without needing to worry about having to, you know, get grant funding and all the additional right, yes. for a short period of time. And actually what I happened upon was, was what ended up being my first role in industry, um, which was at a South Wales based cell therapy company. Um, 
and as I say at the at the time I was kind of a bit disillusioned with academia and I sort of thought you know mm. I want to try something else I really wanted to stay in science so I kind of like as I say it, it became very much you know a just pure luck that I happened to see this particular job I think I was actually approached by a recruitment consultant to apply for the job yeah um and at the time I was just kind of like yeah sure you know let's let's see what happens and I have to say up until the point that I was actually in the interview I didn't really think I wanted the job I just thought I'm just I'm just exploring what's out there so you know we'll give it a whirl and see what happens yeah you know it it was kind of great because it meant that you know I wasn't really particularly nervous in the interview because I was kind of like you know I'm not really sure that I want to work here anyway so I was just very much like (laughs) myself you know um not particularly nervous just talked about you know my experience what I've been doing stuff so actually Mm. went really well probably for that reason um and then it was only when I was looking around um their their labs afterwards I was kind of like actually I could really picture myself working here and I think I enjoy this and you know it's it's not so different from academic research you know this is actually a chance where like you know the the work that I'm doing could actually have some major impact because you know it's much more more close to patient impact and you know there's there's decent funding to be able to do what you want to do and Mm -hmm. and so it really opened my eyes to sort of all the benefits of of working in industry and again I think you know I I think it's a bit of a cliche but in academia it's always seen as being the dark side right you don't I think (laughs) if you're in academia people that move to industry are almost looked down upon a little bit mm. but all oh, right you, you know you've you've gone to industry you, you know maybe you couldn't make it in academia you couldn't hack it you know you can and I just think that that's you know entirely the wrong attitude to have and I'd sort of argue at this point in time that actually if you want your research to have real impact you need to go and do it in industry and not, not sit doing it in academia I appreciate it's not for everyone and it's you know horses for courses and definitely there's a lot less freedom you know you need to yes to to still be constrained by you know obviously what the company wants you to do but again if you get a good fit and and it's still interesting to you then I I think that um industry can actually work out really well as well yeah and I think you know going back to sort of your your reasons for being interested in science in the first place a lot of that as you said was quite practical right it was the practical elements of it and and of course working in industry typically you're working on stuff that's much closer to being applied and and you know perhaps is impatience or is getting there but there's there's a more tangible problem that you solve in and you know it's it's all founded on that foundational research that the academics do of course and so that's an important part of it too but for someone like you who likes that hands-on practical part of it then then the appeal is is clear Um, and I think a lot of people though as you touched on there find themselves in a similar position to to you um to the one you found yourself in in that they come to a point where they realize perhaps that an academic career isn't what they want to do long term for whatever reason and there's lots of different reasons for it but there's sometimes not a huge amount of guidance as to what else is available it's one of the things we're trying to do with this is is to try and shed a bit of light on that but um yeah interested in in sort of your experiences of making that decision it sounds a little bit fortuitous which is which is sometimes how it happens but yeah any any other recollections of that period no, I mean, as I say, I really do think it was it was fortuitous. And again, mm. going back to the the people aspect, I'd kind of realised that who I worked for was really important. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, I think if there'd been no human connection in any of the places I've ever worked since, then I think I would have really struggled with that in terms of like, you know, I definitely needed to, you know, have have that that feeling that I fit in the team. Do you know what I mean? Like in terms yes. of like personality and and just that that I would get something out of you know like enjoying with the people enjoying the people that I'm working with um rather than it just being a job I think that that was definitely I realized that was really important to me yeah and I I think people put more emphasis on this as they go through their career I think as they realize those things I think particularly when people are early in their career um or making transitions in their career that that sometimes gets lost a little bit and there's more focus on well how much investment do they have and and what are they going to pay me and those are important things obviously but I, i've said this a few times on this podcast so if people listen to it regularly they'll be bored of this by now but for those who don't <laughs> one way i heard this described which i thought was really nice is at the end of your career you won't remember what your salary was in that job or, or how much your pension contribution was um you'll remember the work that you were doing and the people that you did it with and that yeah. that's the thing to focus on um so yeah I, th- I think it's 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 a good realization and people come to it at different points 
and, and some people never come to it at all but uh, I think it, life becomes easier once you make that make that transition um and and you were there for a, for a few years. You you um, were the the head of biology there and, and worked on their platform, um, their cell therapy platform. And then what led to you becoming involved in SLURS? Um, yeah. So again, I think this was a little bit of a, a chance conversation in, mm. in part. So I think um, there were kind of two elements that that really led to me moving to Celeste. So one um, was that the the company that I was working at took a little bit of a slightly different tack in terms of its um focus so yeah. I'd, I'd been brought in to, to start um, an oncology platform and to set that up so I think you know that kind of um was for whatever reason was sort of a bit slow to be established and so I think the, the focus then was sort of less on that so I felt like you know it I feel like I got to the point where I wasn't making so much impact anymore in terms mm. of what I was doing um but also uh, it was the, a sort of a chance conversation um, with Trevor Dale, actually, who is who's one of the founders of Celeste, one of the academic founders, who, again, I knew from my time at Cardiff University. Trevor actually had examined me for my PhD ah, okay. a really long time ago. So, um, you know, I'd, I'd kept in touch with Trevor and knew, knew him really well. Um, and so, you know, he, we were just talking about, you know, his, this new company that he'd set up and, and how that was going and what they were doing and all this sort of stuff. And it kind of sounded interesting. And, you know, and, and it's, you know, at the time they were they were looking for a lead scientist. So it seemed, you know, I just sort of thought, oh, you know, this seems like a, a pretty good fit in terms of my background skills and my experience. And, you know, in terms of in terms of what they were doing at Celeste, it was like a really nice hybrid between. Obviously, I, I mentioned that one. When I was working during my my PhD and an organoid technology came about, it's kind of seen first yes. the transformation that that had had, and so I really kind of understood the technology and knew that it was potentially really transformational. And I sort of understood what Celeste were trying to do in terms of making that technology available to mm -hmm. people in terms of you know being able to to manufacture organoids and and to provide those. And I could kind of see the the value of that technology and how how much impact it could potentially have. Um, and so yeah, so. Uh, so that I think those two things, I think, you know, the 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 sort of interest in, in what I was doing at my current job was kind of tailing off a little bit. And obviously this this opportunity came yeah. about. So I just thought, you know, let's let's see where this goes and see um see what happens. Um and so yeah, so at that point I kind of made the made the decision to um to apply for uh, apply for the job at Celeste. Um, obviously I'd spoken sort of I'd spoken to Trevor off the record about yeah. it and a little bit about what was going on because I'd kind of approached him about that um and so yeah so that that's kind of how I ended up moving to Celeste really and, and you've touched on it there the the sort of the the experience you'd had with seeing a new research model an organoid model come in and, and I suppose that's been a bit of a theme through your career is is a focus on research models um whether that's disease models or platforms or, or whatever it might be and I think it's something that people overlook sometimes when they're thinking about the path they can go down but it's the it, it of course you you're often limited in your research by the models that are available to you right and by the not just physically limited by them but in terms of the the sort of paradigms and the way that you think about things um is is that do you think what's continued to draw you to research models and disease models the the sort of impact that you can have with them yeah absolutely i mean i, I as i say i really think i think that's it and i think you know that there's there's definitely a saying out there that there's there's no right model to use right <laughs> um you know I, I think there's no no one model that will give you all the answers you need to use you know unless you're going to go out and start testing in humans which is obviously ethically questionable sure. you know um you, you need to be able to piece together the information that you need from a range of different models and i'm definitely a believer that you know you need to choose the right model to give you the right answer right so mm -hmm. you, you need to and you need to use those models together to be able to build a, a full picture of of what you're trying to do and um, so i think basically the more models that are in the toolbox that are available for researchers to use can just give you so much more information when you're doing you know preclinical studies yeah um and i just think that you know as i say the, the more models that are available the better and also having an understanding of how to use the models what the limitations of the models are you know what the models can't tell you as well as what the models can tell you it's just really important. So yeah. as I, said, I think, um, you know, from a company that is trying to, you know, get get organoid technology into other people's hands and get them to use them, I think it's really important to have that technical knowledge as well in terms of being able to say, you know, look, the models just can't do this. You know, they're not capable of mm -hmm. doing that. So if you're asking this very particular question, you should probably go and look for a different model. Um, but likewise, 
the, the, the best places to apply the model are in these particular areas. And so this is where you're going to get the most value and the most, you know, most information out of the model and the most valuable data. So I think those two things together are really important. Yes, yes, no, that makes sense. And, and so we've talked about a lot of the, the transitions that you've been through in your career, Vicky, from, from the UK to the US to, um, to, to sort of transitioning through having a family, which has had a big impact on a lot of people's careers. Um, to industry, and then more recently through from being very research focused and, and scientifically focused through to a broader, more commercially focused role that still involves um, lots of lots of scientific elements. Um, thinking about those transitions, are there, are there things you think that you have learned through that journey or something you wish you'd known at the beginning you know there's a piece of advice that you'd give to people who are perhaps earlier in their career or or, or making some of those transitions at the moment yeah so I think you know I think the key thing that I probably go back and tell myself is that you don't need to know everything about a job to be able to do it right yes I think, like particularly for definitely for me and I know like plenty of other examples particularly in females actually is is the imposter system imposter syndrome is mm -hmm. a really massive issue you know like I think uh, as I say particularly females seem to suffer with imposter syn syndrome and you know just that feeling of not knowing everything doesn't right. necessarily mean that you know what you have got to offer isn't valuable you may not know every answer but actually you're not expected to and most people don't know every answer right mm -hmm. like who knows who knows every answer in, in any given situation yeah. pretty much no one um you know I think the important thing is to you know if you don't know an answer just admit to it because you know that no one knows everything and there is no expectation to know everything um and to just surround yourself with the right people that if you don't know the answer there's someone in your team that does know the answer and that you know that's that's their job as well you know like I think um definitely having that realization that you know there's no expectation to know everything and that it's all about all about the team around you that you build to yes. really put you know you need to put those jigsaw pieces together to build the picture you're not expected to be the picture yourself yeah and I think like that's that's definitely been something that I think I would go back and tell myself and you know as I say don't don't be afraid to to try different things even if you feel like you know it's it's not your department or it's not your expertise as I say you've always got something useful to offer even if it's just a different point of view um that that can be really helpful and I think you, you never really know like the benefits that you'll have on that and and again for for from a personal point of view it gives you the opportunity to try out all the different areas of the business that you would never normally get exposed to and you have no idea whether you're like or not so one thing that was a really big surprise to me is actually how much I enjoyed the commercial side again right. being academically trained and coming from a, a pure academic background you know I started off doing some commercial work not knowing what even most of the words meant you know <laughs> what what on earth is return on investment I have no idea right. like even like simple things I was just like I have absolutely what on it you know what's a PL? what what's you know I had absolutely no idea what any of these things were what do people mean by top line and bottom line you know like most of these are financial ones as you can tell mm -hmm. um <laughs> but you know like I was just I, it was just like absolutely no idea and it's only by like getting stuck in and getting involved and like picking it up and you know sometimes just biting the bullet and asking those stupid questions you know that that you really you know that's kind of when you start learning and actually for me I just realized that actually it was quite interesting and I really enjoyed it and I understand that you know I enjoyed the understanding the bigger picture and knowing all the mechanics of how everything works together and how the different departments you know need to really be able to dovetail together to make that work um, yes and again making sure that none of the departments are operating in isolation because you know I've, I've definitely seen examples where you know particular departments are really siloed and actually that that doesn't help because then they're off doing something completely different and you need to keep that communication across across everyone you know there's no point in having a bd department that's going out selling a load of stuff that then the operational side can't deliver on for example so no of course you know, i think that's it's as i say um as as i've progressed it's been really important to me like to to keep being an integrator and to really you know make those connections across the company and to keep everyone working together in harmony yeah and I suppose the 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 route that you've taken to that of doing all these different things and being in those different environments is helpful I guess in in seeing seeing what's not being seen by someone who perhaps hasn't sat on the other side of the table yeah exactly yeah it's interesting the point around imposter syndrome I think um we we certainly anecdotally see this becoming a, a sort of something that people comment on more regularly 
And partly that might be because it's been named and identified now, right? It may it may well have always been there. But I think you're right. I think it particularly affects women. And I think it's also partly driven by this idea that we kind of assume that everybody else knows what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which I don't think is typically the case. I think most people are kind of working it out as they go along, right? But it's... Um, I think you do build resilience around it or you build sort of reflex around it. If you if you put yourself in those situations where you don't feel 100% comfortable more regularly, you sort of become more comfortable in those situations, right? But it's a really good point. Yeah. Fabulous. Well, you, you talked at the beginning, uh, Vicky, about uh, what you're doing with Celeste now and, and the fact that you're embarking on, or you've embarked on, the biggest fundraiser in the company's history, which is very exciting. Yeah. Um, I suppose that's the focus for now, but anything else you can tell us about what's next? Yeah, I mean, absolutely long time. Again, you know, um, the, the expectation obviously is that, that that we'll get our fundraise completed. And, yeah. and from that point, we'll, we'll go through, as I say, it's the biggest fundraise in Celeste's history. It will lead to the biggest period of growth in Celeste's history as well. Sure. So, um, you know, we'll certainly be looking to expand into new premises, build the team, um, expand what we're doing on a scientific level, expand our commercial offering, you know, really looking at expansion across the entire uh, breadth and depth of the organisation. So it's going to be a really exciting time of growth, uh, no doubt a period of hard work as well. Um, yeah, as, as I say, I'm still relatively fresh into the CEO role, so obviously looking to continue that and to, to you know, execute on all of the really good groundwork that's kind of gone before me in terms of you know um executing on the business plan that we've got and and making sure that we kind of realize our potential and then you know really the ultimate sort of vision of Celeste is really to, to make sure that organized do transform drug discovery and that mm -hmm. the technology is accessible to everyone so you know um in terms of, of what we're trying to do as a company as I say the more people that we can get using organized the more people that we can get using organized across all stages of the drug discovery process or that you know whether it's from very early early you know target identification or, or very you know even very early compound screening all the way through to kind of like you know the later like preclinical studies and you know yes. the final final checks and and testing before going into animal models or clinical trials whatever that'll be you know it'd be really great to see see organoids being used and, and as I say right across that that right across the the whole drug discovery pipeline oh, that would be great yeah, absolutely. Well, it's it's an exciting time. It's a busy time, as, as you mentioned, and uh, we wish you the best of luck with it. Of course, you know, we always have a vested interest in seeing companies in Cardiff being successful. So so we we'll keep an eye out for you and we're rooting for you. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on Careers in Discovery. And don't forget to subscribe for more insight into the world of drug discovery and R&D. Do take a look at our sponsors, Singular Talent, and their mission to make hiring better for companies and individuals in drug discovery and R&D. You can find them at www.singulartalent.io. See you next time.